Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome to Defamation Part 2. Alright, let's get going. So we've seen this slide already, so we're not going to worry about it too much. So the moral of the uh, lectures is to try and investigate the process of def processes, should I say, of defamation and metamorphism and the resulting rocks and structures. And we're going to try and think about where those rocks and structures fit into the larger plate tectonic setting. So when it comes to deformation, we already know that deformation occurs in one of two types. There's brittle deformation, where the rock breaks, and ductile deformation, where the rock will essentially uh, flow or stretch or shear. Now, we know, we've already gone and discussed the different types of stresses and strains and the things that affect stresses and strains. And we've spent some time already looking at faults, so ductile deformation of rocks. So now we're moving on to the brittle deformation of rocks. So in today's lecture, we're going to spend some time looking at fractures. And we're also going to think about deformation and how, you know, how these different types of deformation, the structures they produce, fit into the plate tectonic settings. Okay, so we've seen this picture already once again. So we know that rocks will deform in one of two ways, ductile or brittle. We know that ductile deformation will result in folds. And we know that brittle deformation will result in fractures. And one of the things that a fracture can turn into is a fault. Now, we also know that brittle and ductile deformation are restricted to different levels of the Earth's crust. We know that in the top 10 kilometers of the Earth's crust, you are more likely to get brittle deformation because the rocks are cold and relatively strong. Once we drop below the brittle ductile deformation, and that typically is about 10 to 15 kilometers down, we move into the ductile field. In the ductile field, temperatures begin to go up, so the rocks are warm. Because the rocks are warm, that means the minerals become more malleable, and so the rocks will be able to flow and stretch and be deformed in a ductile fashion. So essentially, the strength of the rock has now decreased. So brittle rocks, so the brittle zone, rocks are strong. Ductile zone, rocks are quite weak. They will flow. Brittle deformation, obviously, so brittle zone, brittle deformation dominates. Ductile deformation, ductile deformation dominates. Not really a big surprise there. In terms of ductile deformation, you'll remember there are three structures we can form. Anticlines, synclines, and monoclines. So in terms of the different structures, the main two are anticlines and synclines. So you remember that anticlines have an arch shape to them. And they will have the oldest layers, oldest layers of rock in the middle and the youngest layers of rock on the outside. Synclines, on the other hand, will have the youngest layers of rock in the middle and the oldest layers of rock on the outside. And as you can see, they will form this trough morphology. So anticlines are like an arch, synclines are like a trough. And when it comes to folds, they, t they come in four varieties. There is the symmetrical fold. That is when the limbs of the fold are the same length and the same angle. So the fold is equal on both sides. There is the asymmetrical fold where the limbs are different lengths and different angles so the folds the fold is different either side of the hinge there are overturned folds in this instance you will see one of the limbs is vertical and they're not shown in this diagram there is a fourth type of fold which is a recumbent fold which is when the fold has fallen completely onto its side And you'll also remember that when it comes to uh, putting the data we can get from rocks onto a map, well, obviously, we draw the rocks themselves on the maps, but we also put on symbols to tell us about which way the rock is dipping. So if it has angle, which way it's going into the ground, the angle at which it's going into the ground, and we also take something which is referred to as the strike. So if you remember, when we look at these symbols here, this is called a dip and strike symbol. So we have the number, that's the dip, that's the angle at which a layer of rock is dipping into the ground. 
And if you remember, that's the angle relative to an imaginary horizontal plane. So in this case, for this particular layer, it's 40 degrees. We have this little portion of the dip and strike symbol here. That is the dip direction. That tells you which way the layer of rock is dipping into the earth. So I can see on this diagram here, bearing in mind there's the north arrow. So up here is north, down here is south, over here is east, and over here is west. I know that this layer of rock, this brown layer, is dipping at 40 degrees to the west, because it's pointing this way. I know that this peach layer is dipping 28 degrees to the east. And the final thing I know is the strike, which is this longer part of the symbol here. And that tells me which way the layer of rock is trending, essentially, which way it's orientated. So I can use these pieces of information to essentially work out what's going on. Well, I can see these three layers of rock here, they're all dipping off to the west. These three layers of rock here, they're all dipping off to the east. So I have the layers on the left are dipping like this and the layers at the right are dipping like this. So I have myself an anticline. If you also remember, there is this symbol here. This is the horizontal bedding symbol, which is of course the circle with the cross. And that tells me right at the, right at the hinge of the fold here, you can see the bedding is going to be horizontal for a very short period of time. So the dip would be zero. And if you remember, we have this line here. This is of course the fold axis. Okay, that's just a simple line. And if you remember, there's also a two-dimensional plane, which is called the axial plane. Okay, so that was a very, very quick run through uh, ductile deformation. So now let's think about brittle deformation. So let's have a think about fractures. So fractures really only come in two varieties, joints and faults. Okay, so... Brittle deformation are by far and away the most common geologic structures. There's a reason for that. Most of them form in the upper 10 kilometers of the Earth's crust. They are relatively shallow. And so that means there is a very high chance that the rocks that have these features will at some point appear on the Earth's surface. On the other hand, when you think about it, ductile def you know, rocks that show ductile deformation have to come from 10, 15, maybe even deeper in the Earth. So that means it's a lot more difficult to get a rock from 25 kilometers down to the surface of the Earth. It's a lot easier to get a rock from just 5 kilometers down to the surface of the Earth. So brittle, def brittle deformation is a lot more common than ductile deformation. So brittle deformation will occur on multiple scales. You can have anything from small cracks, which are millimeters in size, all the way up to huge faults, which run for hundreds to thousands of kilometers in length. So we have these two different types of brittle deformation. Now, in both cases, we have a fracture. We have a crack in the rock. So the first type is a joint. So with the joint, we have a fracture. So we have a piece of rock either side of the fracture. But those pieces of rock do not move relative to each other. The rock cracks and that's it. The, the crack will typically get filled by another mineral later on. Done. So joints are typically very shallow and in some cases chemical weathering can concentrate along the joints. Remember a crack in a rock is a is a place along, along which water will move preferentially and water is you know the primary agent for chemical weathering. So, you know, joints are, you know, a prime target for chemical weathering. Joints will also be commonly filled by a later mineral, as I mentioned. The second type of fracture is a fault. So in the case of a fault, we have a fracture in our rock. So we have two pieces of rock either side of the fracture. In the case of a fault, one of the pieces of rock will move relative to the other. So there is what we refer to as slip. One piece of rock will slip relative to the other. And faults come in two varieties. Now, don't worry, we will discuss these in greater detail. One type is called strike slip, and the other, strike, and the other type is called dip slip. Okay? Also sometimes referred to as dip and strike or strike slip. So dip slip faults, also called strike slip faults, are split into three subgroups, which are called normal, reverse, and thrust. 
Don't worry about that yet. We will cover them all in detail later on. Okay, so first of all, let's have a think about our different types of fracture. All right, well, this is a joint. So a joint is simply where we just take a piece of rock, we, we stretch it, it breaks, and then the two pieces of rock move apart ever so slightly, creating a very, very small crack, which will fill with a, a, you know, another mineral later on. Now, each crack can be, you know, millimeters, maybe a few centimeters in size. So each crack on its own is pretty uninspiring. But if you have a look at this cliff face here, look, you've got what? Three dozen cracks, maybe? In total, let's just say for argument's sake, each one of those cracks is one centimeter. That's 36 centimeters. So essentially, what you've managed to do is by having all of these little joints in your rock, you've managed to make this piece of rock a little bit extra. You've made it, you know, you've made, you've, you've increased the length of it by just a bit more than this ruler, just by adding 36 little cracks in the rock. So it's quite an effective way of making a piece of rock that was this long, just a little bit longer. The other method, of course, here are faults. Now, in the case of a fault, the two pieces of rock either side of the fracture will move relative to each other. They will slip past each other. That produces something which we call offset. So here's a nice example. So obviously you can see it quite clearly. There's the fault plane itself. So there's the fracture, not difficult to miss. Okay. Okay, and did I draw it on? So what we'll do is we use what are referred to as marker beds. So the marker beds show us which way the faults have moved. So if we look carefully, we can see, okay, here's this marker bed here. We have the orange bed above it and the rusty red bed below it. Well, here we go again. There's the orange bed right here. And here's the rusty red bed right here. So there's the marker horizon there. So I know that this side of the fault has dropped down relative to this side of the fault. So I, I can see which side has slipped and I can see in which direction the rocks have been displaced. Okay, so how do we form joints? Well, the first way is the most straightforward, burial and tectonic forces. So in the case of burial, when a rock gets buried, you know, let's say it's one, two kilometers down in the crust, it's got one or two kilometers of rock pushing down on it the confining pressure still isn't that high yet, so the weight of that rock above it, pushing down on it, is sufficient to make the rock crack. Relatively simple. In the case of tectonic forces, if I'm taking a piece of rock that doesn't have a crack in it, and I'm pulling it, pulling it, pulling it, eventually the two pieces of rock will snap, and a fracture will form, which is our joint. So it's very easy to form joints by either burial, or tectonic forces. Those are the two most common ways of forming joints. So another way we can form joints is through cooling and contraction. So we've come across these things already. These are called columnar joints. So this is what happens when we have a layer of, you know, typically uh, mafic or intermediate magma which is typically in a very, very thick lava, lava flow, or maybe a sill just below the surface. And this lava flow, this thick lava flow or sill cools down. And as it's cooling down, of course, the rock solidifies, but the rock is still hot. And so the rock has to keep cooling even more because, you know, the rock, it, so if, if it's a piece of basalt, okay, the magma is at 1,200 Celsius. The, mag, the lava itself, the magma, has fully solidified, it's become completely solid rock by about 950 Celsius. So that means to get from, it still has to get from 950 Celsius to room temperature, 25 Celsius. So there's still 925 Celsius of temperature that rock has to lose. And so as that rock cools down, it contracts, and as it contracts, it, it fractures. And so that results in these cooling joints, which we can see in this material here as these columnar joints. The final type of joint we have is through what's referred to as unloading. And 
unloading when we ha occurs when we have a rock that's under pressure. So if we look at this diagram here, we have ourselves a rock, okay, and this rock here is under pressure. It's got all this rock on top of it. Now let's just say that you know there's a a release of pressure. So let's say maybe there's a landslide, and all this rock suddenly goes away, or maybe erosion just gets rid of it. All that rock is suddenly gone. Well, this rock here can all of a sudden it no longer has the pressure on it. So what does it do? It starts to expand. And as it starts to expand, well, what's happening? You're trying to make a brittle substance increase in volume. And obviously, when it tries to do that, what's going to happen to it? It's going to crack. And so you're going to end up forming joints because of expansion as well due to unloading. So the most common way of forming joints is simply due to burial and tectonic forces, but you can also get them due to cooling and contraction and unloading. Okay, so if we have a look at these uh, these photographs here, what can we see? Well, we can quite clearly see in this case, this is a classic example of columnar joints. You can see each one of the columns here, okay? And you can see they're all separated by these long vertical joints in between them. So in the case of this picture here, you can see we have these long vertical joints here, okay? So these are going to be caused probably by either burial or tectonic processes. In the case of these joints here, where well you can see we actually have what's referred to as joint sets. We have one set of joints coming this way, and we have another set of joints going that way. Now the cause of these joints is possibly a bit debatable. These joints could be produced by tectonic processes or they could be produced by uh, unloading. So essentially, uh, if I just go back for a second, well, they could be produced by this process, simply removing the pressure. So by removing the pressure on this rock here, the rock could start expanding. And when the rock expands, it will naturally form two sets of joints, one that way and one at 90 degrees to it, which is what you can see right here, where we have one set coming through here like so, and one set coming across it at 90 degrees. So these joints could be tectonic or they could be due to unloading. Okay, so how do we form a fault? Well, it's pretty straightforward. So most faults are formed when horizontal or vertical compressive stresses exceed a rock strength. So a lot of faults are caused by the compression of rocks. Not all faults might, but a lot of them are. So we can see in this case, we have ourselves a cylinder, a rock, and we start compressing it. The rock itself remains strong, so it's not failed yet, but it is uh, behaving in a slightly ductile fashion. You can see the column has gotten slightly shorter, but the column of rock is slightly, starting to bulge out slightly at the equator. Eventually, you will exceed the rock's strength, and the rock will fail, and it will fracture. Now at this point, please notice, these pieces of rock have not moved relative to each other. So at this moment in time, this fracture here is a joint. It's only when they start to move relative to each other that we actually have a fault. At this point, these two, this piece of rock here is slipping relative to this piece of rock. And at this piece of rock, this time, at this point, we have offset. Okay, so obviously once a rock begins to slip, this will cause displacement. And displacement essentially is, you know, the change you know, in, in rocks relative to each other, the movement. So the way we see displacement is we look for these marker beds, these very obvious layers of rock in a sequence that help us work out where we are. So if I look at this sequence here, what can I see? Well, I can quite clearly see there's a step right there, can't I? It's very obvious. And so once I can see this step, I can work out pretty quickly the fault plane itself is coming up through here about there. Not perfectly, but about there. So I can see I've got one marker horizon here, this big, thick, darker layer. And I can see the same layer right there. Okay. So what other layers can I see? Well, I can see I have this slightly larger white layer here. Okay, and I can see I have the same corresponding layer right 
there. I have this thinner dark layer right here. Okay, and I'm just gonna look carefully. I can just see it's not as good down here, but I can just see it right there. Not 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 that nice, but it's just about visible. Okay, and I can just see I've got this very very thin layer here, which sits below the blue layer. You can just make it out there. And here's the same layer, right there. Okay. Now, obviously, I can see exactly where my fault's going now, can't I? I can. It's not that difficult to miss. So my fault's coming through right there. So obviously, by looking at these marker horizons, I can see how the units of rock can move relative to each other. So I can clearly see that this side of the fault has dropped down relative to this side of the fault. Okay, so how do we describe faults? Well, obviously, the first thing is we need to think about the horizontal line on an inclined surface. So this is a fault here. So this is what's referred to as our fault plane. So our fault plane is the fracture along which the two pieces of rock will move relative to each other. Now, the thing about a fault plane is a fault plane is a flat surface. So a fault plane will have dip, so it has an angle. It has a dip direction, the angle in which the fault plane will be dipping, so the, the direction in which the fault plane will be dipping. And it has strike, which is the orientation of the fault. So it has all the same features as a normal layer of rock. So a geologist can take all those pieces of information from a fault plane. So the strike direction of our fault plane, if we use this model here, is going to be orientated like so. In terms of our fault plane, in terms of dip, well, obviously, as we can see in this instance, we're showing the dip, the angle, by showing how water would flow down the surface. So obviously, if we took an imaginary horizontal plane here, we could measure the difference between the imaginary horizontal plane and the dipping surface here, and we could get the dip angle. You know, if I had to ballpark it, it's somewhere about 40 degrees or so, if I had to guess, in this particular diagram. And then simply, we would have to work out the dip direction. In what direction was this surface dipping? Is it dipping north, south, east, west, northwest, southeast, whatever? We just have to work that out. So this is because it's a natural, a naturally inclined surface. So fault planes, being a flat surface, have dip, dip direction, and strike. So we can get all those three pieces of information from any fault plane. Okay, just, and we've already seen this diagram here. So this diagram shows you a bedding plane, so essentially a, a layer of rock. And we can see this layer of rock here is dipping into the surface, okay? Now we know, we, here's our imaginary horizontal plane. Here's the layer of rock itself, so we can measure the dip, dip angle. That's 30 degrees, which is the difference between the horizontal plane and the flat surface. We have the dip direction, which is the direction in which this layer of rock is dipping. So once again, if this is north, this is south, this is west, and this is east, this layer of rock is dipping, to the east. Once again, if you remember, we don't say north, south, east, west. We say 000, zero, zero is north, 090 zero, zero is east, 180 is south, 270 is west. So this would be dipping 30 degrees, 090. Zero, zero. And then at right angles to the dip direction, we have the line of strike. And the line of strike is there to tell us the orientation of the bed. Now, you can't really get that based on this diagram here, but we saw diagrams in the previous lecture that did kind of demonstrate why having strike is important. Okay, so now let's have a quick think about types of faults. And, you know, obviously things are quite mysterious because I've already got some arrows going on there and a block of text. So clearly I did not get my animation very right for this slide. Let's see what's about to happen, shall we? Okay. So first type of fault. So in this case, you can see here are our blocks. Here's our fault plane. 
okay? And in this case, you can see the pieces of rock are moving relative to each other. They're moving past each other. But look, there's no change in height, okay? Now, if you remember, so this is going to be, the dip is going to be coming down here. The dip direction is going to be like so. So it's going to be over here. So that means this angle, where these arrows are going, that strike. So that means this block of rock here is moving along strike, along the fault strike, isn't it? So what we have here is what's referred to as a strike slip fault, because the block of rock is slipping along strike. So then we have the other type of fault. This is called a dip slip fault, because look, this block of rock is falling down the fault plane. Essentially, it's going down the dip of the fault. So this is referred to as a dip slip fault. So in this case, you can see these two blocks are changing height relative to each other. So dip slip faults come in one of three varieties normal, reverse, thrust. So strike slip faults, there will essentially be one type of which there's two sub varieties. In the case of dip slip faults, there are three varieties of dip slip fault. Okay, so we'll very quickly discuss like that, strike slip faults and then we'll stop this presentation. Okay, so if we look here, we have a strike slip fault. So you can see we have two pieces of rock they're moving relative to each other, but there is no change in height relative to each other. So they're just moving past each other. Got to stop hitting my microphone, do apologize. They're just moving past each other, but there's no change in height. They're just moving past each other. Okay. So the two sides are moving horizontally relative to each other with no change in height. So, okay. Now, what we can see here is we can see that the blocks are moving in different directions. We can see the block on the left, which I'll use, say, in my left hand here, and the block on my right, which is my right hand. So actually they're moving this way, aren't they? If you look at the picture on the screen, the left block is moving, if you, as you want to describe it, towards you, and the right block is moving away from you. So it's doing that, isn't it? Yes? Now, when you use your hands like this, whichever hand is moving towards you tells you something about the fault. So in this case, it's my left hand is moving towards me. Okay. So that means this is what's referred to as a left lateral strike slip fault. It's also referred to as a sinistral strike slip fault. So once again, I have the two pieces of rock. This is my left hand. This is my right hand. So you can see the, the block diagram on the screen. And you can see the left hand side of it is moving towards you and the right hand side of it is moving away from you. So it's doing this, isn't it? So the left hand hand, the left hand is coming towards you. The right hand is moving away from you. That means as the left hand move toward, moves towards you, it is a left lateral strike slip fault, which is also called a sinistral strike slip fault. Now the reverse is what's going to be referred to as a right lateral strike, strike slip fault. So let's do the same thing. So I have the left hand, I have my right hand, and once again, you can see the right hand is now coming towards me, isn't it? As the left hand goes north, the, the right hand naturally comes south. Okay, so it's moving towards me. So I can see this must be a right lateral strike slip fault, which is also referred to as a dextral strike slip fault. So we have left and right lateral strike slip faults. Left lateral strike slip faults are called sinistral. Right lateral stri strike slip faults are called dextral. Okay, and it's very simple to work out what type you're looking at. You just have to move your hands and that will tell you very, very quickly. Okay, so let's look at this picture here. So we can we can quite clearly spot the offset, can't we? We can't really miss it. We can see there's a blooming great big fault coming through right here. Not difficult to spot at all. So the question really becomes is, can we spot essentially where the offset is? Well, yes, we can see here we have a kind of green-gray horizon right there. 
and here it is right here. Here's the same green gray horizon right there. Okay. Now you can see that's then followed by a slight yellow horizon, gray horizon, yellow horizon, gray horizon. Okay. So you can see we have ourselves, now it gets a bit messy here, but we have a yellow, gray, yellow, and then we're back into the gray again right here. So we can see the sequence, can't we? So we can see that this side of the fault has moved this way relative to this side of the fault that's moved that way. And remember, it's all relative. So this side of the fault, relatively speaking, is going that way. This side of the fault, relatively speaking, is going that way. Okay, so not that difficult to work out. So we've worked out there's our fault and we've worked out, now those are some little sub faults, we're not going to worry about those, they're not that important to us. So the question then is, is which direction is the fault moving? Is it left or right lateral? Right, so imagine you put your hand down and it's going to be the, the piece of rock down here in the left, okay? You're then going to put your other hand up here and it's going to be the piece of rock on the top right, okay? Now we can see the piece of rock on the top right is moving this way and the piece of rock on the bottom left is going that way. So it's doing this, isn't it? So hold your hands towards you. The right hand piece of rock is coming towards you, isn't it? So that makes it a right lateral strike slip fault. So that's the sense of movement. Okay, so is it left lateral? No. Is it right lateral? Yes. Okay, so we're going to stop part one here. So once again, get up, have a walk around, glass of water, cup of tea, cup of coffee, whatever you fancy, and then please come back for part two.